From the southernmost point of Dorne to the lands of always winter, what is west of Westeros and the shadows of the east, this is Casterly Talk. I'm Cat Napsuck, so happy to finally be here talking about House of the Dragon, episode one, the pilot episode, if you will, the heirs of the dragon. I am not doing that alone tonight. Joining us and returning to Casterly Talk is Andres Cabrera and the one and only Golden Diaz. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Andres, good to see you, friend. Good to be back, man. Talking about Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. So, so excited to get into this. Oh, it's amazing. Alden Diaz, we've been texting all day. Giddy as schoolboys. Giddy as schoolboys. How are you? Oh, I am excellent. Better than I was earlier. And earlier, I was feeling pretty good. I texted you. It was dawning on me that it was today. Yeah. Uh, we've all just now seen it once, I think twice. I one and a half times. It's a whole thing. But yeah, it's a it's we're in a world now where there's a Game of Thrones show currently running, which That's is right. amazing. House of the Dragon is here. Here's what we do over here on Casually Talk. If relatively new or just discovering us, this is just the uh, reactions, reviews, surface level stuff. That stuff's fun. We're going to talk about our favorite moments, things we love, maybe some things we didn't like, uh, things that we're hoping to see, all those kind of fun things. We love diving in deep, discussing what's on the screen, what's in the story for us to digest, the big themes, the lessons, the big moments, and of course, the things that connect to this world that we love so much. Uh, this episode, uh, written by Ryan Condal, written for television by Ryan Condal, who is, of course, one the showrunners and co-creators credited co-creator along with george r. r martin and director is miguel sapochnik also a showrunner and man you know it was definitely a sapochnik episode and i mean that mm -hmm. in the best of ways quick summary of what we watched and we'll dive right, right on in here viserys the first is the chosen heir to jaharis first uh she got to get selected to the great council of 101 over rainies meaning that viserys did not necessarily seek the throne the power and burden was given to him we jump ahead to the 19th year of viserys's reign 172 years of course before the birth of daenerys Ver viserys for the first is wa awaiting the birth of his son who he strongly believes is the answer to a prophetic dream there is peace in the land, but the inherent thirst for power and violence are bubbling all around him. But in the land, and not just in the land, but in also in his small council chambers. When his beloved wife and son die in childbirth, or at least the day of Viserys versus face, with the horrible reality to choose between his rogue prince of a brother, who has very little support outside of Corliss Villard, and, or his daughter, which would break all the traditions in the land, which choice will secure peace in the land, strengthening the line of succession and keep the realm ready for the reality all the Targaryen kings of Westeros thus far have been burdened with? You must keep the realm together for one day a threat from the north will endanger all of humanity together. All that is big, Andres. Alden, overall thoughts, Andres, I want to start with you. Uh, yeah, incredible first episode. So much information inside one episode, which is really cool. Yeah. We got to explore Rhaenyra. We got to explore uh, the Great Council of 101, which I thought was really cool. Obviously, it was very mm -hmm. short, but still, we got it, which is something that's amazing. And then we got to see the Damon dynamics, which we, I'm going to see a lot of Damon dynamics throughout this entire first season. <laughs> and then, obviously, the ending reveal. I can't get over it. I can't just yeah. can't get over it. I just thought it was so cool. I was like, wait a minute, Aegon? This is yeah. nuts. This is great stuff. We're going to go into that a little bit there, even play some uh, clips, read some stuff uh, that we got to Alden Research. But man, uh, uh, Damon Dy Dynamics, we got a hashtag or, or trademark that. That's like, <laughs> sounds like a good, uplifting, uh, like uh, Dianetics <laughs> Scientology. <laughs> Damon yeah, right. Dynamics. Alden, Alden, uh, yeah, fun. It's just fun to be back in this world. Doesn't mean we're not going to dig in a little deep, finds out things that we love, things that we didn't. But, uh, man, uh, your overall thoughts on this episode. Well, my first overall thought is that I am finding out now on air what the title of the episode is. I didn't know it was called The Heirs of the Dragon. To be uh, clear, yeah, to be clear, I, I did kind of look that it, it could also be very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably right. I think that it was... Uh, a situation not dissimilar to Obi-Wan or Mandalorian, like they got yeah. added after the upload, which is totally yeah. fine. Um, so that's just a cool note for me. But overall, I loved, loved this episode. Incredible start. Yeah. Um, like Andres, like you were saying, dense, so dense, but also paced extremely well, where I was like, wow, 101, oh, we're here, oh, we're there, oh, this already, oh my God, the death of mother and child in episode one, like it was so much um mm -hmm. i mean air for a day the whole falling out 
in one episode. And I was amazed by how clean and smooth it was. And like you said, Ken, Sapochnik in the best way. That man put a camera right above the lance on a sword, on a horse, <laughs> going all the way in. And I was like, oh, this is Sapochnik to the, to the, to the <laughs> degree. I love it. I love uh, you reminded me they got the inside the feed inside the episode feature right after I had to go back and watch that. I, I, I was so excited uh, the first time. But the, to have Ryan Condo be like, yeah, that intercut kind of uh, the the joust, the, the tourney and, and the childbirth oh. scene. Definitely so much. The thing I was like, yeah, totally. It totally reminded me of uh, a season uh, season six, episode 10 with the, the Cersei and, and the wine sip of uh, revenge. Uh, great stuff there. Yeah, for me, I did an amazing job of setting out the uh, setting the pieces on the board, which any pilot's going to need to do or try to do or, or episode one. But there's a lot of pieces and a lot of history and and a lot of fans returning. And and we're we're always here to talk to all sorts of fans and all sorts of perspectives. But without a doubt, the, this show will only succeed if the general fans return. And now I'm not talking about fans who had issues with the the show before. Just sort of like, oh, cool, dragons are back. Uh, I already had one of my friends text me. He's like, I thought that came out tomorrow. Oh, my God. I'm going to watch now. I'm so excited. I have known nothing about this. And this show had that burden. And I think it lived up to it there. I, I did feel, uh, and I want to talk to you guys about this up top. I, I felt like what I thought was, hear me out here, a lack of energy. Not in the I mean, so much energy all the way through it. But a lack of maybe warm energy that the 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 show uh, started with way back in 2011 and and you're always going to have those comparisons and we're here to break apart the two shows and, and mm -hmm. keep them on their own lines but it's hard you're back right and you're seeing a lot of things yeah. you're, oh that that's the thing that's where Kat, Cersei was on the map oh, and you get so excited you get giddy um but there wasn't like uh, Robert Baratheon Tyrion Leonard, where right away it, it gave it their own so I just was like I want to hang out with that guy this was a little bit more, dare I say, stoic because I think it had the burden of so much information to get out. I don't know if I'm off base on that with you guys. Andres, do you think anything about that? I feel like a lot of that is is the characters too, right? Because we don't necessarily have a Tyrion Lannister type of character or a character yeah. that's like a fun-loving, cool guy that you kind of root for right away. Because yeah. right away, you know that that's not necessarily who Damon is. And mm -hmm. the, the show makes yeah. you want to be like, yeah, that guy's looking like the cool. It's like, no, Damon is not. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I feel like that's the characters. And I feel like that's very, yeah. I feel like that's very fire and blood, though. I feel like that's kind of mm -hmm. part of what the book is as well. Yeah, no. To be clear, I think I think it's uh, it's it's doing what it needs to do. Like yeah, Viserys, kind of like the first time you meet Viserys, he's cracking a joke with his mates, his small council, this and that, and and. The, the time, the era, the story is not going to allow that warmth that he does have shine through. So I think in a way, it's almost kind of the point. It's just in, in an era where you're going to have some fans returning going, oh, OK, OK. And I, I think this this is uh, even though they've described it as a more intimate show in terms of character stuff, uh, it had a stoic, epic feel like the weight of the realm is is on a lot of the folks here. And so I think it's, it's both a success and just something that I, I felt and noticed, you know. All yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I agree with Andres. Like, it's character first in the best way. And that mm -hmm. comes through. Like, in Game of Thrones, um, we meet a lot of characters at a warmer place. You get to see right. Ned and Kat as loving parents. You get to see Tyrion as a as a drunk and, and you know, and, and a sex pest and, like, all this stuff. And But then that that was all robbed of these characters much earlier in their relevant arc we've seen Tyrion's darkest days way later in game of thrones some people's darkest days are now in house yeah. of the dragon some people's darkest days are today if you're viserys if you're oh my god Ama, i mean yeah I, not to jump so far ahead but i will say that that too for me is one of the most haunting things i've ever seen on tv right out of the gate um yeah. it's brutal and so yeah this, this series cannot by nature of what it is introduce you to anybody like there's no like rob and john ripping yep. getting the haircut mm -hmm. and all that like it's not going to be that type of story um and the energy that you know, like i love what you said andres like they could have easily presented damon as cool rebel and they they almost do for a second and then they yeah. hit you with the gold cloak scene yeah. and let you know this is what we're dealing with yeah rip from the headlines yeah great stuff no i love what you're both saying there yeah and uh yeah it, it's uh it, it like i said it, it's just the weight of the, everything hits real fast you, you get the idea. Viserys would just love to be having dinner, joking with everyone, but that's not what this is about. And try yeah, to work well, on his model. Oh, which I love. I love what that meant. <laughs> it, it lacked the big, stunning reveals of of, of, of GOT one, right? The White Walkers, uh, Cersei, uh, and Jamie. That was quite a reveal. And then, of course, what happened with Bran? 
Uh, but this came off as to me as a more complete uh, vision of what the, the show is, what the show we're going to get. And that's time, experience, a little bit of budget. I hate to throw budget in there. Uh, you know, Game of Thrones didn't have an unlimited budget in the end. But, you know, you you, you got some folks who know what they're doing and know what they want to do with this show. It's the second right. time out. Right. Away. right. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's dripping with confidence, I think. That was a word that I, mm. I thought of. And we know as three fans, people watching Casually Talk, we know that the original Game of Thrones pilot was never seen. And that's uh, a 90 to 95% reshoots. And I love that pilot. I think it's one of the best ones ever. But this yeah. is one where you can feel it. They're like, you all know King's Landing. We're happy to be back. You're happy to be back. Let's go. Yeah. Love it. What's time in the big moments? And and saying this up top, uh, we have Andres uh, for a shorter time tonight. He's uh, he's a double booked, which is why I'm so thankful he took the time to come on the show tonight. I also want to acknowledge this show and this season are going to address a lot of uh, big uh, hot topic uh, kind of conversation pieces around gender and gender roles. And we're going to have a lot of conversations about childbirth and everything. And we're, we, could, we, we in this panel tonight can only discuss our own perspectives. Uh, don't worry, this panel is going to represent a lot of different folks all the way through the season. But this is uh, us talking about it tonight. Just want to acknowledge that up top, to be honest about where we come from. Um, I have uh, currently not given childbirth. So I'm not going to speak from experience uh, when we talk about Emma's uh, horrendous end. Um, but let's get into some big moments. Ace, I want to start with you. Where do you go first? Where are some big moments? What themes poured out of those moments? I mean, I think you just named it. <laughs> no, but uh, that's I'm gonna go into it. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. When uh, uh, that was horrific. My God, uh, mm. Emma's uh, death that we we hear about, obviously in Fire and Blood, but th the way they described it in the show, and the way they did it in the show, is way more specific, um, and way more detailed as far as the desperation for his son. And I feel mm. like that's exactly what the realm is built on it's built on having a male heir going all the way back to the great council of 101 with rainies and with the series that mm. is kind of the theme of the entire episode probably the theme of the entire show is probably mm. going to be that gender role and gender reveal as far as who gets to sit on the iron throne is it the firstborn yeah. or is it the firstborn male heir so uh, that that scene like you said intercut with the tourney yeah just nuts nuts yeah, really well done Sapochnik special. Yeah, without a doubt, all it is this this play of violence. It's the violence of the land. It's the violence, the senseless violence of men thirsting for power and played with, with women on on what is their battlefield in this world. That's why Emma has that bath uh, conversation with with her daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of the sense of duty. There's a lot of what traditional roles and what you're expected to do. Maybe what some of the characters don't want to do. Renair is honest of that up, up top it makes her kind of endearing, at least at this point in her life. Yeah. Uh, so that that was a beautiful use of just violence and how violence is is uh, tearing part everyone in this land quite literally in some tragic cases so i love the use of that uh you will yeah the implications yeah. of violence are as important in this mythology as they are as, as actual violence is actual violence decides a lot of things in game of thrones but what it all means and to have two characters corliss and rainy sitting there at the tourney yeah. talking about how x y and z individuals you know there in in the fields don't know war they don't remember the days. They don't, they've never heard the stories. It's they're too far away from it to really understand what's happening. And you combine that with Ama's scene with Viserys when she's in the bath and she's mm -hmm. apologizing for not being able to deliver on what she feels is her duty and the sadness and the feeling like a failure, giving that characterization to her before mm -hmm. she goes out was just just compounded that pain for me as a viewer. I you really came to know and love her very quickly. She's extremely mm -hmm. kind. She's extremely it seems like there's a lot of love there. You get a wonderful mother daughter scene. So for her to go out in that way is hard. And I think that a, I think what I love about the script is that a lesser script would have you would have come out of that scene really angry with Viserys for making the choice for what we know in modern science as a C-section as a cesarean. Uh, the maester is describing it as, you know, there is a way that we could just get the baby. And I think that I was ready to be angry with Viserys. I was. But then you really consider what is said. It's either they will both die. Her life, it's over. There's no question here, King Viserys. What yeah. you are choosing is, do we attempt to save another life? And that's what I think preserved. It was very smart. It preserved his position. So when he grieves, you grieve. 
um, and it preserved the horror too. And I thought that it just yeah. came together beautifully. Yeah, and I'll kick it to you here, Andres, real quick. It's a funny, and we're being not, you know, the three of us here always are going to be honest about our own perspectives and this and that here. Uh, my fiance absolutely hates Viserys right now. <laughs> is uh, is yeah. absolutely yeah. horrified uh, by uh, the reality, and and it's even going into the show, they had some interviews about what they were going to show about um, uh, childbirth being a 50-50 proposition, and that's just not uh, not uh, that's not good. It's not good, and that's a reality to even our own world, and it's still a dangerous endeavor. Uh, so I don't say that to to counter or belittle your thought there, Alden. It's mm, just yeah. uh, it's interesting to 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 see that, and and I think um, yeah. uh, the how people view Viserys is, uh, could be wildly different. But I also think the choice, and and, and they talk I talk about it. And I will, I promise, Andres. I'm going to kick it to you here in a second. Uh, but uh, Condal talking after the show about it. yeah, it, it it she's gone either way, which is also kind of the point of the scene. She's already in that spot. She's yeah. already been placed in that. She's on the that, way out, right? She's, yeah, and, and, and to and be that, clear, to be clear, just before we kick it to Andres, I do want to say for everyone out there that is angry at Viserys, I understand. I'm not. Yeah, I'm yeah. not trying to throw creator explanations at you to tell you to not be. Oh my yeah. God, it's a devastating moment. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. All right, Andres, I'm sorry. Jump in here. I, I think it's <laughs> the torture of Ama that is yeah. the hardest part. Because Absolutely. if she wasn't getting horrifically tortured to death, because mm -hmm. that's kind of what it is, being held down and cut open is being tortured to death. That's mm -hmm. what makes it almost so unforgivable. But I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like the acting afterwards from the Viserys actor, I forget his name, off the Patty top of yeah. yeah, he sells the, the amount of burden that he's almost a changed man after doing that. He can't. Mm -hmm. look at himself he can't feel himself it's it's just a complete yeah. transformation and i feel like the acting in the show already mm -hmm. by everyone is mm -hmm. phenomenal to, because to the that son that he sorry good no oh well, quickly to that point yeah i think that uh, andres has an excellent observation after that moment whether or not you yourself want to uh, uh throw him down a well or not or off the wall um he he emerges uh a little bit different in the sense of up until then how to keep the peace is one of the themes we'll discuss here in this episode tonight how to keep the peace and he's he reviewed as a weak queen uh weak weak, uh, weak queen king you know what i'm saying man i've got too many words in my mind tonight he's reviewed as a weak king because he wants to make everyone happy and you see that a lot and then after that he does what he feels is right because I think he saw up front, uh, the, you know, just what happened. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting maybe off the track under this, but I agree with your point. I think he emerges different after that. Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, just to build on what both of you are saying, he's rattled and he's changed. And us as an audience member, what we're engaging with is our rage at what he did. And we're mad at him, but then we pull it back and we're mad at the situation. A lot of this and even all the way, I mean, they, they do that wonderful 172 years before the birth of Daenerys Targaryen, which I loved. That was that was our little a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away moment. I loved all of that. And um, I it, it made me think a lot about the burden of the era in which you're born. Like we know mm. that because these characters are in this medieval world, that there's nothing we can do about that. And it is that 50 50 toss. And she's already dead. Um, she's a dead woman walking yeah. and it's and it's. Yeah. It's terrifying and it it robs you get this whole juxtaposition of, of Viserys's confidence that it's gonna be a boy. I know it is, I dreamt it. Here's what my dream was. I'm so excited, it's what I've always wanted. Other people talk about how it's what he's always wanted. And then he can't even name this baby with any joy in his voice. He's his lips are quivering when he says yeah. Balon. And then I think what we don't see is as horrific as what we do see. Because, you know, if you know the lore, you're like, and that baby's not going to last the rest of the day. And then, boom, you don't even see the baby die. He's gone. Yeah. You get a little bit of a baby cough, yeah. um, which I think was sort of the little, oh, no. And then we're at the funeral. And I think that those hard cuts to mm -hmm. a broken man are, yeah. are very, very effective. Now, I love that. And it all ties into something I'm sure we're going to discuss all through the season. I, I think, uh, Andres, you said it very well. It's going to be a, an overriding theme. Uh, Ama serves as kind of the signpost of what potentially is in front of Alicent and Rhaenyra and, and what you are expected to do as women in this realm and women in King's Landing, even more specifically. And you see, 
you know, going into the, I, I, I failed you. I can't, this is probably the last go around. You know, I can't watch, can't bury more, any more kids. I can't watch any more, uh, you know, pregnancies go. And, and she's telling uh, Viserys that as if it's a failure, as if just her, her sole existence was this and she's failed at it. And then you've got Rhaenyra kind of going, yeah, I don't want to have kids. I want to be, I want to be a knight. I want to ride dragons. I want to do that. And you have Allison kind of, suck up what her father wants to do which is a scene we'll talk about of just like mm -hmm. we got these traditional roles and how you're going to approach it when you got the signpost uh and horrific death i think uh in front of uh hangover both of them i think i, think. I don't know yeah andres yeah, any more yeah, on this yeah. thing yeah no sorry sorry go for it no, no i was gonna say i mean yeah when we get into the auto scene we're gonna have thoughts that's all i wanted to say just just teasing the fact that oh god uh, that guy <laughs> auto, auto thoughts which are also like dave dynamics yeah. Yes. <laughs> Andres, what else? Are you feeling anything more about that scene or anything else jumping out to you? Uh, no, I think that's, I think the it's just the brutality of it. I mean, they mm. start, this is episode one. Damn, I was yeah. like, damn, this is brutal. And obviously we've seen yeah. brutality in Game of Thrones, but seeing how brutal that death was, was yeah. a huge deal. Huge deal. An, an intercut with this, this um, violence rooted in, in, um, you know, uh, powerful uh, masculinity run amok uh the senseless violence full of pride and and false uh, summer there's either knights of summer right here type of idea coming out of rainies here they, they ain't this is an army that hasn't bled and to see that versus this true horrific death that was supposed to be for this great birth this great purpose yeah i i think it was mm -hmm. the core of the episode for me mm. Let's, though, talk about one thing at the end. Uh, we're going to jump all around here, folks. Like I said, this is a deep dive discussion on the themes and a lot more. We do want to talk about this reveal at the end, which is this vision of Egg on the Conqueror that, hey, uh, we need to go conquer this land because, one, I'd love to conquer some land. It looks right for the conquering. But also, <laughs> I think I have uh, this vision of, of why I need to do it. And and we're going to make we'll play a little clip here of where it kind of comes from and, and all. And you can talk a little bit more of the research and, and and who kind of helped you with that research. Let's get some credit out there. But I love how it f it really does uh, slide into uh, this big uh, theme of this burden of power. Viserys, again, is not someone who went ne necessarily went out to crave this power. Uh, Jaehaerys is, uh, is a peacetime king. Viserys is, is chosen uh, in this vote, 20 to 1, according, according to some of the lore. Um, and so he he's given this burden, and it might show he has a different way of looking at it there. And then to add in this angle, I think it's beautiful. It's fun. It's a little cheeky. Of course, he's the, you know the dagger that we know Arya is gonna you know use to kind of bring this prophecy on home here. And we got the Song of Ice and Fire. We got John. We got Danny. We got all these wonderful things that are gonna make us all just have a lot of fun connecting the dots. But it is about the burden of power, and it's this burden that cannot be shared. You must keep the secret in there, just like as I have and of all the kings before me. And he's sitting on this throne that's literally killing him. Um, I just thought that was a great, a great why for the use of this prophecy. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm absolutely inclined to agree. I don't know if you wanted to play the clip and then we dive in or if you want to dive yeah. in before the clip. Um, yeah, let, let's roll this clip now here. And, and, uh, this comes from, and I'm going to give, uh, it's, I've seen it on the YouTube channel, uh, just simply called Aegon the Targaryen, Aegon Targaryen. So I guess Aegon has his own YouTube channel. It's great. Now I, I've watched some clips on the channel before, uh, and I don't know the original source. So, uh, we'll try to find that out here, but here is uh, George talking about it. Cause yes, this is something kind of, dare we say new ish. And one of those things where we're kind of like, wait, scratch your head. Have we heard this before? And here's kind of where it kind of came from. Um, they began to take more interest in the uh, affairs of Westeros. And Aegon finally decided to take over Westeros and unify the seven kingdoms that existed at a time under a single rule. There is a lot of speculation that, in some sense, he saw what was coming 300 years later and wanted to unify the seven kingdoms to be better prepared for the threat that he eventually saw coming from the north the threat that we're dealing with in a song of ice and fire there you go all right that's kind of uh that's fun a little aside from george often you have a little bit more and uh, let us know where you got this information from yeah i want to give a shout out to my friend edgar ortega who's a writer for loud and clear reviews and the co-host of the where heartbreak feels good podcast um and he's a big game of thrones a song of ice and fire lore head and he was like I said, is this is this from text or is this a show edition? 
And within five minutes, he's, oh, it's actually from an interview with Martin from uh, this time. I was like, wow, incredible <laughs> pull. Uh, and additionally, uh, Polygon, uh, who's the entertainment website, Polygon, they ran a quote from Condal, who said that actually came from Martin, at least the origin of that point, he told us very early on in the room, just as he does, just casually mentioned the fact that Aegon the Conqueror was a dreamer who saw a vision of the White Walkers coming across the wall and sweeping over the land with cold and darkness. So with his permission, of course, we infused that into the story because it was a great way to create some resonance with the original show, which mm. uh, two points about Martin that are mm. kind of the same point. What a hilarious man. Like, I really, I think he is so fascinating. <laughs> the fact yeah. that he can introduce mega lore, mega important recontextualizations with casual attitude in the room. But even in that interview, there's uh, some speculation. That would be like George Lucas in the 80s saying, there's some speculation that Vader was once a Clone Wars war hero, but I don't know. <laughs> like, what do you... <laughs> <laughs> some speculation you're you you're yeah. you who's speculating which but i they, love i mean that, and that's the spirit of fire and blood is the yeah. maybe maybe <laughs> maybe that happened maybe it, uh, it, this it, show yeah. being yeah. the account is the thing yeah. yeah i love it uh yeah it's like dj and last jedi maybe uh andres this jumped out to you you were texting us about this what do you think i thought this was huge i i my reaction watching it live i was like wait a minute we've never heard this this yeah. is the first time I'm hearing of this. At least I, I, I did, and and I kind of, I kind of did a scroll on Twitter to see if anyone was freaking out or was it just me? It's just me. Uh, <laughs> apparently, everyone else is like, "Oh, that's a cool name drop, a song of ice and fire." I'm like, "But Aegon having that vision mm -hmm. and kind of taking it upon himself to unite Westeros in order to defeat an, an army of the dead that came from a cold winter, like." I don't, I've never heard that. And I was like, Aegon having that vision and partly doing his conquest, partly because of defeating the White Walkers. Yeah. That's huge. It, 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 it takes it to a lot of spots because this even this whole kind of show begins with uh, uh, Viserys' own kind of prophecy, the one he's telling to his dream that he's telling Emma, the, the one of uh, putting his son on the throne. And uh, we know prophecies are big in Game of Thrones uh, and on Song of Ice and Fire, just the world of Westeros and Essos. And how often it's how you interpret them. Everyone can look at the sky and see a red com comet and see it as something different. So this idea of the weight of prophecy, the weight of dreams, uh, fate foretold, and, and, and does that color your choices? Uh, it's the old destiny and fate conversation. And I, I believe destiny is just something that takes you to your next big choice. Uh, but sometimes uh, you might make a decision based on what you feel you need to do for prophecy. So Aegon does this. It's almost this weird, dare I say, manifest destiny kind of approach. He's going to conquer this land to save it in a weird way. Uh, but then to take that and to really this burden of of the, the throne, this burden of leadership, and, and this what hangs over all of this. The realm is about to be ripped apart. But Aegon, the one who started this whole uh, team, is saying we must be together we must stay together and you must do anything to keep everyone together and we're about to go in the biggest civil war you know on this land so far to this point so just a fascinating use of it it, it is truly not just a name drop it has great meaning and, and i'm right i'm with you Ace. i i'm i i i kind of did the old sit up in the chair too mm -hmm. oh i was i immediately like ace like you can i just immediately was i had that wonderful moment of everything's different now um in in ways because i was already already you're already in the mindset and and some great yeah. visual storytelling you're already in the mindset of the weight of the throne not just because we've seen what happens to that throne shout out to drogon but also because we're seeing uh yeah. he's got a he's got a sword nick on his back and he gets yeah. another one on his finger and it's like the throne is having literal effects on you, symbolic of the actual weight of the crown, of the of the weight of that role. And then all of a sudden, boom, here's the real weight of yeah. that role. Here's here's and, and the best thing is that it, it's a it's an answer that raises more questions. Did mm -hmm. the song get all the way down to mm -hmm. Ares and Rhaegar and Robert Baratheon? Perhaps, perhaps not. Didn't Baylor burn a lot of lore? Didn't such and such rediscover some lore, Rhaegar? Like, who yeah. who knows when this song ends and stops? But what I love is that it's sort of, I mean, we're here. We're open about it. Three season eight defenders. We have qualms. We have different opinions and everything. But the, the season eight ending point that some consider to be too cheesy, too cute, and too on the nose of Samuel Tarley saying, mm -hmm. hey, I forget the maester's name, but say, hey, maester such and such, just wrote this book. It's called The Song of Ice and Fire. 
my yeah. first thought when this episode was over was that maester knew that maester knew someone talked someone talked because it said you know yeah. kings and heirs yeah know this did the mad king know this is that was this what happens when you give a paranoid mentally ill person this part of it, this information well does you know, become that Maybe that's why the Mad King was shouting, burn them all, burn them all, which is part of uh, what a lot of f people had fun speculating there. Yeah, because I got to think Robert Baratheon either didn't know this or didn't care, right? Or wasn't telling anyone. <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah, and it's yeah. like he's not uh, he's not in the, the family line that kept this. I mean, it it, it adds to the duality, right? The, the madness or greatness of House Targaryen that we talk yeah. about. It's, yes, they dominated for so long because they could. Yeah. But there's also the knowledge that only they had which is that they believe they should. And and right. believing that you should, as Damon shows, is a theme that is ripe for exploration because it is such a quick path to darkness. I think that I should be this. And yeah. I, I just love that it puts this heroic sort of complication over everything that they've done um, all the way up to Danny. You tie that in with the fact that they opened with the Danny shout and it's yeah. gold. It's fun. It's fun and it's deep and it's purposeful. And I love it there. Andres, uh, final thoughts of that or anything else you want to go? I know we're going to lose you here in a little bit. And I want to make sure I get all your thoughts. Yeah, I definitely I want to focus on this just because it's the moment yeah. that I freaked out the most. But I mean, part it. of it, too, is like, it, it, did it reach Rhaegar? Obviously, we saw that vision with uh, Danny, but in the book with, uh, mm. I, I think he mentions A Song of Ice and Fire. I think that was Rhaegar um, from Danny's POV. And yeah. then the second thing I had in my head was, the idea that dragons are key in order to win this war. And the fact that a dance of dragons or the dance of dragons that we know kind of had a hand in eliminating dragons. So this civil war that we're about to see is actually yeah. a detriment to humanity itself because dragons are what the Targaryens feel is mm -hmm. what's going to help them in yes. order to fight back this giant evil that's coming. And I was just like, That's, it's all connected. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It just well, blew my mind. I love what you just said there, buddy. I love what you said there because there's uh, both in, in nice ways and in challenging ways. I've I've heard the question and the question has been just directly asked of me. It's like, well, OK, but why should we care about this show? What What's uh, as a Game of Thrones fan? Why should I care? And well, it's a dance of the dragons and it's just kind of fun. This and that. But now you can kind of have this overriding arc. And I don't think it's a simple just a, a simple concept. I think some of us are talking about the dance of the dragons is going to lead to eventually. And we've still got 172 years and that's been clear but it's, it's going to lead to the destruction of this dynasty there's that great line you could have baratheon's tongue for that tongues will not uh, change the success succession let them wag the baratheon is gonna be the dude that does it <laughs> you know it's like yes it's, yes it's, there was that and yeah. the baratheon lord that's supposed to swear fealty is the only one that has a that actor shout out to that actor whoever you are i should have grabbed your name uh he takes a beat he's the only one that takes a beat yeah. Corliss doesn't, uh, yeah. the uh, Lord, Lord Stark doesn't, Hightower doesn't, but the Baratheon is about to bend the knee and he kind of takes a second. And I was like, Oh, you sneaky stags, yeah. you, you, yeah. Sneak. And, it, and to me, and Andres, I don't know if you agree with that. It, it's way, it is, I think it's way more than wink and nod stuff. I think it is mm -hmm. connecting it in big ways. Oh, yeah. I, I think this is why I'm so outraged right now on GOT Twitter and everyone's like, oh, that's the name. <laughs> and I'm just like, it's freaking Aegon having a vision and uniting yeah. the dragons. And that's part yeah. of the reason why he felt that he had to be on the throne because he only had the key to defeating this evil, which is a dragon, because uh, we know dragon fires can burn whites. Yeah. That yeah. is huge and that's why i was like the vision yeah. Aegon, all this kind of coming back together with game yeah. of thrones is yeah you, you even got viserys given this this wonderful you know kind of lesson a hard and and maybe mistimed lesson to there. i love what she's like you haven't even spoken to me and he's like i got something to tell you uh we got bigger <laughs> things to worry about than your feelings uh yeah they be we should have trifled with this power that we the idea that we control uh, dragons it's just basically this lie it's this illusion but we need them and they need them for what's to come and you're right andres you said it they end up losing them and we're left without them except for uh the three that are uh uh, you know, growing up in Essos with mama. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's fun. It's big. And it's way more than just that. Hey, that's a show you watched. It's, and to it's, build it's off of that, to build off your points, Ace, and, and, and that about, uh, about, I was gonna say Patty, about Patty uh, and Millie, uh, about uh, Viserys and Rhaenyra there is that 
there is no and the beauty of of all prophecies there's prophecies in most fantasy the prophecies in game yeah. of thrones ask stannis baratheon about prophecies they are there to be misread narratively i mean that's why like yeah. writing professors will tell you that they're there yeah. to be fallible um and you inject fallibility into your story you you let everybody like you said ken i love that shout out to the red comment um oh it means this i know that yeah. because god told me and it's like well did, did they it uh, means this and i'm gonna do things based on my belief what that comment does it right is, and yeah, what's great thing. is that what the information i've i've read now people people you know people that had the press screeners ran their articles immediately that had viserys's dialogue nowhere in there does he know or did aegon know and presumably any king when so every targaryen king since aegon thinks they're the one that's going to have to fight this so you yeah. you show me the episode of this guy and you're like why are you trying to please everyone man stop pleasing and then you're yeah. like oh i get why you're pleasing because you need yeah. a unified house yeah, it's the burden of a pressure. Andres, we are going to take a break on the podcast side uh, and uh, say goodbye to you shortly. But any final thoughts in this first episode or maybe uh, what you're thinking about uh, episode two? I'm so excited for everything that's to come. I'm excited to see dragon action. I'm excited to see more politics, more Corleys. I'm already attached to the actor that's playing him. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to my house. My house is Valaria now, at least for this show. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I'm just excited. I'm just so pumped for this show. I, I'm excited to have you here. We're going to have you on talking uh, more and more. Uh, before we take this break on the podcast side, again, we'll roll through on the video side. Make sure you're following Andres, but also all the stuff you're doing over there on First Cut, because you, uh, Andres, are going to be doing kind of uh, mini discussions on this uh, uh, stuff over there as well, right? Yeah, First Cut, we're going to do, but it's probably going to be on Instagram Reels and probably yeah. on TikTok. And then on YouTube, I'm going to, I want to put uh, House of the Dragon discussions, like five minutes long. So make sure you guys check it out. So I'm probably going to be editing that later on tonight super yeah. late tonight uh, super late. Nice. We'll let him get to that. And uh, he's going to be here with us as well as he has been before. Andres is one of the deepest, most insightful uh, commentators out there in this space. So if you're just kind of seeing him, uh, his takes on Star Wars, his takes on Game of Thrones and other properties are very valuable and very insightful and very fun. One of my favorites. Andres, thank you for uh, stopping by on the show tonight. Appreciate right. you guys. Have Bye. a good night. Peace out. All right, we are uh, rolling on here on uh, the video side, and welcome back on the podcast side. Uh, I feel like I'm uh, you know, simulcasting a baseball game. Album. You're doing a great job. I mean, that, that that was that was pretty seamless. He's gone. We banished him. He's no. I love Andre. Number one, number one fan of Baelish. That guy, number one fan. Oh um, yeah, yeah. You know, we, <laughs> yeah. I, I I was gonna, and there was a tech delay that I was I, for me before we started recording tonight that we lost a little time with Andre. So I'm, I'm angry at myself because I did want to ask him if just seeing that cat spa dagger again uh, brought up any yeah. feelings in his Baelish loving heart. Yeah, last time it's done. <laughs> it's also the the sweet choice from Sapochnik and and Patty Considine to grip the cat spa dagger as the story is delivered too, which. It's like, does does he know that Valyrian steel is something? Did Aegon talk about that too? Because yeah. yeah. you get the idea that whatever's being passed down, he, mm -hmm. he, it's it's a it's a brief moment. There's business to attend to. Maybe later he sits down with her and he's like, and by the way, here are all the bullets and sub bullets of uh, <laughs> what I actually know. But yeah, I mean that changes everything. But there's. Yeah, there's yeah. so much to talk about here. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fun, and and I love the quote you got from from Condal in this interview. I'm so thankful to your buddy to so uh, just quickly pointing that out because uh, yeah. you know again I've 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 read Fire and Blood, I've read the maps, I've read this, I've read the books, and I just had that like, man, did I just miss that? I don't recall that at all. But it's just a little tiny piece of information from George that 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 again I think is used with great purpose. Uh, this idea of the burden of power, which I love a little detail there, and you and I can start to get into more of the themes. The Saris. And his, we were joking about on the live show having his like miniature, his his miniature train town, as I called it, <laughs> building a model of uh, of just King's Landing, which to me represents the the realm, and him just always thinking about the realm. The realm is there, and he's always whittling with it, sculpting it, fixing it, because this is the burden of this well, thing he's given. Not to not to step on your point, because I love your point, but his model is old Valyria. Um, yes, sorry. no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, but yeah. but you're but you're still right. You're still right. I mean, it it still works for him because is it is is he work? Is he fiddling with this realm? No, but it's still right. his grand perspective. Yeah. Um, no, he's yeah, obsessed no, I, with it. Yeah, he's yeah. I, I, with, I'm, uh, I'm gonna scroll okay. down to my notes, Alden, where I can read what I actually wrote myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's look. 
Ladies, yeah. ladies, gentlemen, friends, it's 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 late. Uh, it's, but the the yeah. way that he reveres Balerion, and he was Balerion's last rider. Yes. Um, yes. The way that he reveres Balerion as being the last person to see their ancestral home. The way that he um, looks at this model. Uh, he's making the one to one. So you're still right. I mean, he is looking at the way that that realm fell versus yeah. this realm, which is you know cannot fall based on what he knows. It can't. Yeah. If it does. Yeah. The world falls. Absolutely, yeah. He he's he you know believes you have to look to the histories uh, as best to learn, move forward, and keep perfect pr protecting. Which is why he makes this tradition breaking decision to put uh, Renera in, in line. Uh, which is as we've already learned pretty early on. Uh, just as Randy, yeah, it's against tradition. Uh, and and a lot of folks can have some uh, opinions about that, but. Yeah, Balerion, under the skull of Balerion, it wasn't, again, just not just a, hey, we've seen that skull, we've heard. No, it's it's pretty powerful. He's the last one to ride this creature that was the last to see old Valeria for all it was worth, the greatness and the flaws. And then to have him, yeah, then in his uh, chambers, whittling away at this thing that keeps him up at night and how he's always focused on it and goes into other themes that we're going to talk about, blood and where the loyalties lie, family, duty, the realm, all these wonderful themes. But to have it in this miniature, of old Valeria, thank you for correcting me there on, on the fly. Um, the idea that the doom of Valeria can be repeated, you must mind the histories. I always go to George Lucas's quote, uh, when he's talking in the prequels, and he says, You can mess these up. I made American graffiti, it made like two cents. <laughs> you can mess this up. And here's here's the Viserys in the food court having Sabaro, Sabaro thinking about old Valeria going, <laughs> It can happen again if we're not careful. No, I mean, th that. yeah, those entire, every, every mention of Valyria of the home during the scene where Allison visits him, which we will get into, yeah. uh, I, I kept hearing the beautiful voice of Jorah Mormont, the doom of Valyria and all that men had lived, the doom consumed it all alike. Yeah, like it just, it's it's lingering over he, these events mm -hmm. in a way that it, and, and appropriately, the events of The Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones are, are further down. And so there is a more of a distance there. Um, you know, Tyrion and Jorah, they're talking about old Valyria um, like a fable they learned about as boys. Whereas he has A, this knowledge, and B, this ancestry, and C, recency, more recency. Yeah. Um, and it's pain. And and if you go to the, the beginning of the Great Council, which I loved, we talked about this in our, our hype yeah. party, would it be an episode? Would it be the prologue? And it is a prologue. And uh, yeah. Emma Darcy... I can't tell actually. Is it Emma Darcy or is it Millie that narrates that? I believe um, I believe it was Emma Darcy. I think sounds I think a little older. Were, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they were the voice there, but yeah, yeah. Not not sure. Yeah, it would, it would make sense if it was, if it was uh, Emma. Had a little bit of like uh, a little bit of you and I were joking about. You know, this was this was us nineteen years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it had that vibe, and and I will give a shout out here. I just found this out. This is breaking news for me. Uh oh. Uh, our friend Brandon, uh, Brandon Winerdy from Talking Bay 94, pointed out that King Jaharis was played by Bib Fortuna himself, Michael Carter from Return of the Jedi. So wow. shout out to him. There shout out to him. Uh, <laughs> old Bib sitting there. <laughs> just, oh. Oh, wow. I, got the, I got to figure out this air. Oh. That's great. That's <laughs> what a great. wonderful piece of British casting. Uh, yeah. That is yeah. so British. It keeps it keeps that uh, world of ice and fire Star Wars connection going all the way through, uh, from yeah. Veers, Veers and beyond. But That's yeah, I mean, he's sitting there, and mm. by the end, it's like you rewatch the episode twice. I rewatched the episode almost twice. Yeah, about, you get yeah. back to that beginning, and you're yeah. like, "Oh my god, this is so important!" Like you, <laughs> you start yeah. to realize again, like yeah. everyone's sitting there. Those looks between Rainey's yeah. and her cousin Viserys and. His yeah. look of regret, like, I'm sorry I passed you up on this. I didn't really want to, but also it's the law. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you what, what, what do you think about that and, and, and how it's really been it, it's really um it, it's really apparent in, in, in what they're trying to tell in this episode. And and to be clear, I think I think that in, in 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 the after the episode, a little feature they talk about this about you know, Viserys wasn't one of those uh who went out to get the throne. He wasn't even in line for it. And then the two uh you know, the two brothers die and uh uh uh, uh, you know, here's where we're at. Jairus' son died, and here's where we're at. So, I, what, what do you what do you take from that being central to this episode? That Viserys didn't necessarily crave this; he was given this. I think it's a fascinating 
intro to an idea that I hope that they explore throughout because even the men, the men that are closest in this, you have Viserys yeah. and his brother and Viserys and his hand. And all mm -hmm. three of them have different feelings and perspectives on this. And Viserys, we believe, and we are told, and, I, and I'm inclined to agree with the fact that he didn't want it. I mean, I, I think that's how Patty plays it for sure. I think the performance is wonderful there. Um, mm -hmm. and he, and he does just want what's best for the family. And then, and he didn't want it before he found out what it meant because yeah. Kings and heirs know this yeah. Kings and heirs. So you got to assume Jaharis pulled him aside after that and was like, Oh, and by the way, by the way. um, and that's, that's the darkness of it. But Otto's line, probably my favorite line of the episode. Um, mm -hmm. and I am paraphrasing should have jotted it down. Um, but, uh, the gods have yet to make a man that didn't crave power or that didn't, I forget, crave you know, the, power. Yeah. Yeah. Crave, yeah. Crave absolute power. Um, yeah. Wonderful, uh, important line. One of those lines that uh, both Grace and I kind of went, ooh, like. And yeah, kind of telling on yourself there, Mr. Hightower. Kind of telling on yourself. Um, yeah. Which was well, an interesting, yeah. interesting beat there because, I mean, I, I don't know if you're if you're down to jump into the Allison stuff now. Yeah, well, I would, yeah, I wouldn't talk. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's dive into it. There's, there's other uh, great, big, exciting moments. Uh, we talked about a lot of them. Um, uh, there uh, was, uh, yeah. yeah, let's say uh, we had a nice format, but I'm just so excited to want to get to the big stuff. And I don't want to leave Allison behind because this is a, a character that has been positioned um, outside looking in as she becomes kind of an antagonist, kind of a villain. Even some of the performers, Olivia Cook. Uh, talking about some of the connections to Cersei, and it's so easy to uh, call her just this angry woman. And uh, Emily Carey had a great interview. Uh, I was watching them talk about this, and they said it's so important to see her as a as a teen, the role I play, because you're going to see the who, what, and where, and why of of her turning into that, and maybe you'll see it as more as more of that. I'm paraphrasing at this point, uh, so it's valuable to start here with that character. So that you have not just those famous Game of Thrones shades of gray, but you have a you have a big why as to what she's going to do later on and some of the stuff with her. And we're going to get that with Renera too. We're seeing that as well. But anyways, I think Allison's important. So let's dive in. What do you think about Allison and the scenes here? I think that not only is Emily Carey brilliant, Allison was my favorite character outside of Damon because that's kind of like my that's like when people ask you who your favorite Batman villain is, you got to put the Joker on a shelf. Like I got to keep Damon over here because he was already my guy going into this. But Allison was like my biggest surprise, uh, mm. my biggest point of intrigue. I thought that she was wonderful. I sympathize with her. I was endeared to her. What, that scene of them studying. Um, mm. uh, can, can you still call it a God's wood if there's only one big tree? I don't know if it's the yeah. God's wood of King's Landing, but it, it counts. counts, yeah. Look, if I have one hot dog for dinner, it's a hot dog dinner. So there you go. I mean, that's going to be the quote of this episode. And people are going to be like, what is he talking about? Uh, yeah, you know. that, that scene of them yeah, studying. There you know. What'd you, you have for dinner last night? A hot dog is still hot dogs. Hot dogs, gods, very similar, very similar. God, gods, gods, wood, where wood trees. It's all the same. Hot dogs. It's song of gods and hot dogs. <laughs> that's um, exactly. But yeah, I mean that scene of Rhaenyra, who clearly does have the knowledge and the know-how and the care and everything, and she shows that by the end of the scene when she's like, "By the way, I did study. Here's this, 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 and this, uh, just oh, to oh, prove it, Allison." Yeah, yeah. Just to prove it to Allison, yes, I am paying attention, but I'm I'm dealing with a lot, so I'm playing it aloof and trying to joke about how I'd love to fly away to uh, yeah. cross the narrow sea and eat cake all day. Um, yeah. But Allison's reaction to her joking mm -hmm. says so much, and I think that every every character in this episode, all the principals, get a moment of this is who I am at this point, sort of summed up. And I think that that studying mm -hmm. moment where she's upset with her for not taking it seriously. Uh, and she's perplexed and 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 sort of incensed by her feelings on a prince that mm -hmm. she she's like, you actually what you you feel this way? Like that sort of says so much about the way she's grown up pre this show since being a little girl, um, a, a motherless child, which is heartbreaking yeah. and plays in later. You are so endeared to her position immediately, the position yeah. that she's in. And then when she is trying to have a tender moment, with the father that has made her this way mm -hmm. it only lasts about 30 seconds before he gets into machinations mode while she's yeah. trying to be a human being yeah. and he preys on that in his mm -hmm. own kid he knows he has a good kid and he's going to exploit the fact that he has a good kid because 
he says, oh, well, the king will appreciate a visitor. And yeah. we, you know, we know, we've seen the trailers, we know the characters. I'm sure some people are going in completely blind, and but yeah. I doubt the Casterly Talk audience is going in completely blind. So we oh know. But it's but it's right away picked up on in his chambers. Yeah, yeah. yeah in his chambers. And, and then, you know, we know Olivia Cook's later on and their relationship mm -hmm. and role. And she's perplexed and Otto pushes her into it, taking advantage of her good nature that she does care about people and is a good friend and a good person. And then he throws, Oh yeah, throw on your, your mom's dress too. Uh, yeah. And not to say that he doesn't care because as Damon will tell you, he cares. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there's that moment of realization of this. This is a really, really just a nice young woman that mm -hmm. just was used as a pawn in a game. And that immediately for me, more so than, a lot of our villains villains um, was mm -hmm. a moment of humanity that I appreciated so much. There's some, there's some great Allison moments here of, of how you understand the character and keeping um, what Emily Carey is, was saying in that interview that, that I saw and keeping that in mind. And some of the stuff Olivia cook has said, uh, I put it yeah. into the, the Allison uh, high tower prep video that came out uh, earlier uh, today. If you're watching uh, uh, at the time of this release, uh, Olivia Cook saying, "Hey, I'm playing this character that's like so the opposite of me. I'm this like staunch feminist and and, and want to move forward in a lot of different ways. And and um, Allison is this traditionalist, but it's this tra traditionalist because of the roles are put upon her. So there's these key moments that I love. Uh, one of during all the violence at the tournament, the jousting, the fighting, the blood and the gore, and with her just gripping this blood grip, uh, picking at her at her at her nails, her hand, just this." trying to just i can't i don't want to be here this is not good i'm there's nothing about this i like and i have to sit through it because as mm -hmm. she said early on there's a line she has it's best get on with it which is kind of this theme uh that she's got and that she's she's stuck in this and there's there's rainier and allison we know they're going to be on opposite sides but it's to me kind of two sides to approaching the duty the roles they're in whether they want to be in them or not and how they look at it. And we have the tear the page girl who's like, I got it. I want to eat cake and this and that. I know what you're talking about. And and I and I'm I've I've got a different experience and a different way of approaching. I, I'm a dragon rider. I'm uh, I, I want to be a knight. And then you got on the other side, I've got to be daddy's girl and I got to be part of the plan and I got to do what's right because blood versus uh you know her, her other duties or other loyalties uh is gonna be mm -hmm. key for this character. Is is my duty to my my name, high towers? Is it my duty to my eventual husband and to the realm? And what do I want? And does that factor in at all? And there's this girl just ripping her fingers as she tries to just get through this and best get on with it. I thought it was a powerful look into what she who, who she is and, and what's gonna happen to her and what she will do. Yeah, because she's accepting some of the lessons that Ama speaks to before her death mm -hmm. of what our battlefield is. Um Again, yeah. just th throwing in that I I'm a male, I'm a male presenting, yeah. identifying person, but uh, you know, connecting those lessons together. I mean, she's accepted it at a young age, whereas Renera shall not even hear it. <laughs> it's not that she yeah. doesn't understand what the mother's saying, but she wants something different for herself in a way that can't uh, can't exist in this time. Whereas Allison, my interpretation was that she dare not even want something for herself um, mm -hmm. because yeah. what else, what else? And I think that that anxiety is throughout her the entire time um, throughout her characterization and presentation. And, but again, still kindness, just yeah. warmth because obviously Otto's sending her there um, to literally and figuratively, well, eventually literally right now, figuratively yeah. get it, get more in bed with the throne. Um, yeah. But what she chooses to say when she gets there is all on her and the way she chooses to go about that moment. Yes. A rare moment of purity in a song of ice and fire world game of Thrones is that everybody said X, Y, and Z to me when my mom died riddles, I believe she says, yeah. and I would have just preferred an I'm sorry. And so I'm, I'm going to give you an I'm sorry. And mm -hmm. that's the first sort of like Viserys's eyes sort of light up for the first time since the death scenes and that yeah. meant so much to me to where you can understand almost why that would be his eventual partner yeah 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 and 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 as uh you know it's a little a little bit of uh, you have some of the icky vibes going on that at auto like what are you doing auto but a little tywin oh. lannister vibes coming off of this there but i love what you're saying there that this is a key point and there's a reason yeah the saris who uh, doesn't want to hear it and probably I don't know. He doesn't necessarily express this, but it's like the moment she's at the door, he might be thinking, uh, you 
damn it, Otto, I know what you're doing or something like that. You know, he doesn't say that, but yeah. it's just like he's used to this game, used to this this world and, and used to those around them, even though I do want to talk about the Damon scene towards the end where I think Damon actually absolutely speaks the truth. But I love what you're saying. That is, this is Allison on display, who Allison is, despite anything that she might end up doing um, and, and, and what she was trained to be. This is her. I've, I've got this task. I'm ripping my nails. Best get on with it, but I'm still going to present my heart. I think we're still going to present who I am right here in this moment. And, and it's a, it's an endearing moment. I think it's important. Yeah. It's, it's, it's powerful to show viewers what will be snuffed out. You know, that's a moment that we'll look back on. Uh, the trailers for this show, a lot of them end, either the trailer spots, Instagram posts, whatever, a lot of them end with the, now they see you as you are from Rhaenyra. Right. And it's like, but I know what she is and she was nice. And so that puts me in a spot. <laughs> it's so, I can't wait to, I can't wait to see the story unfold. I'm so intrigued by Allison, perhaps even more than I was a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, this is the Targaryen show. You get the high towers. I know she's queen, but now and I've, you know, yeah. again, I've read Fire and Blood Volume One. I know, I know, I know. But I think uh, the show taking it off the page is already kind of, kind of uh, shown Allison in a different light, at least for me, uh, because now we even think about that scene. We're thinking about Rainey's in, in, in some of the future episodes. I don't want to spoil it too much for people who haven't uh, taken the dive into the trailers at all. But, you know, it, it's again, what do you really want? Your father wants this or wanted this or still wants this. You got his backing, High Towers, the most uh, powerful, uh, uh, you know, most powerful, uh, one, one of the most powerful families in the land, Valorans as well, Targaryens, of course, at the top. Um, and then the flip side, like, cool, eventually it, it might be your kid, your sons, uh, Aegon the second. And what do you want? And Rainey's kind of saying, you've never thought about it. You never thought about sitting on the throne. And so Allison just having all this on her, again, digging into them nails as she's yeah. going to try to get through this and make a decision. Perhaps finally, at one point, make a decision for herself. We'll see. I really uh, want to, I'm really curious how they play that out here on the show versus what I've read so far in Fire, Fire and Blood. Absolutely. And and just to sort of, um, you know, back back up a little bit and just to look at the high towers in general you brought up their status and and mm -hmm. how they are they are they're not dragon fire powerful but they are extremely influential extremely uh intrinsically tied in with the land in old town and all of these important institutions you get Otto, you get the picture of the fact of the picture of his family the fact that his wife has passed um which damon prods him about which oh boy oh what a scene um yeah but then also his son you see how he reacts to his son being challenged you see how he reacts to his son on the battlefield. You see how yeah. he sort of gives his daughter a let's, you know, let him fight. Like yeah. he's, he picks his spots. Sometimes he'll step up and, and, you know, try to put someone in his place. He'll make yeah. different moves. He talks later on about how, um, cause Viserys tries to rightfully, he tries to say, mm -hmm. you didn't like Damon in this role or this role or this role. And then you did this. And he says it was a half measure because I was acting based on what I had to do at the time. Yeah, I felt so Otto is definitely a, um, you know, in, in the same way that Allison gets the Cersei comparison. He is he's Taiwan esque, but he yeah. has a, a measuredness about him that I think uh, will serve him. Yeah, no, I look for me. Jury's still out on Otto overall. He, you know, just I'm love watching him uh, so far in this episode. I, yeah, I'm a Tywin fan in a way, which is and Andres is a Tywin fan, too. I would love to have him around for that, too. And I know you enjoyed Tywin as well, but just like. He's wrong, but he's right sometimes. And it's a weird, it's just kind of weird in this world, in this Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, House of the Dragon world, where sometimes some real, real absolute just rat bastards say some things that kind of ring true. And I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how much uh, they lean into some of that with Otto there as mm -hmm. well. And that's a strength of, of all the high, uh, high council, all the small council stuff. No, not the high council, the small council. Yeah. Uh, all of those of scenes here. Those are my favorite uh, moments. A lot of my favorite moments in Game of Thrones are small council scenes. Yeah. And I Absolutely. loved the scenes in this one. I love the, you get the idea that some traditions were lost over time. Like Robert Baratheon doesn't care if you put your little sphere in your, in your little, in your little sphere, <laughs> your little seat, uh, you know, to mark that, that you're present at the meeting. That's all gone by the time yeah. of his reign. Uh, so yeah. that was cool to see. Um, you don't need to draw attention to it. You're just like, oh, that's new, but yeah. old. Um, yeah. But the scenes there, I mean, whether it's Corliss, whether it's Otto, whether it's Damon or Viserys or a couple of our other yeah, lords. How strong there, yeah, Lord Strong. strong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they each of them says something and you're sitting there with your 
pizza or wings or popcorn or whatever. And you're like, that's a great point. We had a really good point. Like, <laughs> and, and, and if you can do that for every character in a scene, it's money. Yeah. It's magic where you're well, like, Oh no, everyone's valid. Yeah. I don't yeah. Like that. yeah. No, I love, I love Corliss already. I'm with Ace. Uh, Steve, Steve Tucson is already doing such a good job because he's, but he's already, uh, you know, I, I, Jerry's out for Damon on, on me, you know, and again, I, I, I've i read the books. I know, but I just, how they're playing it in the shows, I'm so intrigued. And, and uh, you know, Corliss, uh, is, uh, he has my heart, but he could lose it, you know, like what what he does here. So that actually kind of leads into one of the big things I want to discuss here, and we can go to some places uh, where you want to go as well. Uh, I have this big theme, this big kind of uh, lesson out there of how to keep the peace and we see that in a lot of different ways, so beginning with the Great Council of 101. Jaharis I does this to, to try to keep the peace he's had for nearly 60 years through this ruling, uh, through this decision that he lets the, the realm kind of have, of course, this vote that goes down. But this was done by him to be like, hey, this will keep the peace because if, if I don't, war is always, you know, civil war is always kind of brewing. That's one example. Viserys I deals with the burden. Uh, tries to make all happy to keep it, at least early on, and that's kind of the burden because he also knows we learned that big burden at the end. Corliss, there's that great moment. Our, our, our guy Corliss, he starts, the first thing he's talking about is bringing up the threat, uh, which we, we uh, you know, the stepstones and all the stuff going there, brings up a threat to the realm, and no one wants to listen to him. No one is really ready to go to real war. They're playing some other mm -hmm. stuff going on here. And I love that. And the final one there is 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 leading to some Damon discussion. Those Damon dynamics, as they said. Uh, mm -hmm. Damon just using this, uh, hey, rip from the headlines. Extreme violence and brutality. Uh, the concept of fear and power to bring peace. All these different ways and how everyone's struggling to keep the peace. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting point. I mean, you started with Jaharis. Important to note that the spirit of Magor also lingers over this episode. Mm -hmm. He comes up in a few conversations, at least two. Yeah. Um, uh, and to, so within that context, Jaehaerys' 60-year peace mm -hmm. was earned. It wasn't inherited. It, it, he was coming yeah. from, you know, yeah. worse days. Um, and so it's like we keep oscillating between peace and war and destruction and building and all this stuff. And we're finally coming out of a good era. Can we get another one without doing the same repeat that we've been doing? Of course, yeah. tying in with the great Targaryen coin flip theme that yeah. is discussed and known to many fans. Um, but you know, your your point about about fear about institutions like the gold cloaks, and and we see them become the gold cloaks in this. Become, He's the one that yeah, gave yeah. them that, and how the decisions made here about that fear and power reverberate. I mean, I had the thought watching this. And I say this with zero ir ironic comedy. It is drawing a parallel. This police brutality inside of a fantasy setting. Yeah. This is the institution that betrays Ned Stark. This is the same institution. Yeah. And and the, seeing the way that they were established in their current form, uh, yeah. having the impunity that they talk about, that they question. Damon showing in. What were you saying about my impunity? You want to keep talking about my impunity? Uh, yeah. And how that ties in with what you're saying about responsibility and power. Uh, I think Spider-Man said something about that once. A small little quote. You might have heard it. Um, yeah. What happens when people have uh, mm -hmm. this level of ability, whether it's all the way up from dragons down to fantasy police? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and how, uh, you know, how, how far will fear get you uh, is, is one of the big questions. And I should mention, too, Otto uh, having a little bit of a take uh, on Damon avoiding mango the cruel which is also his version of keeping the peace it might be at odds with others it might be at odds with even viserys in the end but but it's it's kind of that as well and one of those things again already i i don't necessarily disagree with otto on this particular subject of what the gold cloaks are doing uh but i you had know, damon has some stuff later on i want to talk about that are just like those count duca when attack the clones like oh that is true though okay you yeah, know yeah <laughs> Um, which is why we love it. And, 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 and overall, our, so going back to or even just an overall reaction to this episode, that's kind of the stuff I felt, ah, I'm home again. I'm home again. Yeah. I don't know which way is up. Yep. It was that that feeling of, oh, okay, we're here. I think that Sapochnik does a great job of bringing us into it with elegance, some narration, yeah. some table setting, uh, lovely dragon flying, and then she gets off and there's some jokes and she gets in the carriage and 
it's all there. And then it hits you with all of these angles. And yeah. I think, you know, to, to connect your theme with something that I was going to discuss about ambition, ambition is in there mm -hmm. too with Damon, yeah. who Damon was everything I wanted him to be. He was exciting. He was thrilling. Yeah. He was cool. But there was all this darkness. There was this sinister energy. There was all this stuff, but he's not without feeling. Mm -hmm. He, you believe that he does love his brother, yeah. um, which I, which I thought was such a great takeaway. Those two actors dynamite together. Matt Smith and Patty Considine in that mm -hmm. scene are doing such a great job. But for me, it was the funeral of Ama and baby Balon. Yeah. He's, he's grieving. He is grieving. Yeah. He's not there with a smirk. He's telling yeah. Rhaenyra, it's time for you to do your part. We have to, we have to set these, the deceased to peace and everything. And he's not right. in the brothel causing, um, you know, his infamous brothel incident. He's not there to cause that he's there. Like he says later, I, I, we all grieve in our own way or, Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing it's others that rile him up and mm -hmm. and 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 make him brush against the dark side of his ambition which is not to excuse him because he makes the choices but yeah, yeah. yeah. but he has the capacity About to the not make them and well so that's it, what's interesting it's there's two key points to him and i this is exactly where i wanted to go next so so great segue ambition ambition um uh, I made up a song like I'm on a Broadway musical ambition ambition. No, two great Damon scenes because he is, uh, he's introduced. It, it's very brutal. The, the gold cloak scene is a uh, very real. It's a very rip for the headlines. Uh, he is, you know, we got the introduction of Masari, all that kind of stuff going on with him. He's, he is the rogue prince. He's a little bit of the bad boy. He's riding into town on his motorcycle, right? Is, mm -hmm. is he uh, going to cause uh, problems uh, in uh, Stars Hollow for the Gilmore girls? Is he? He's, you don't know. He's just rode in that motorcycle. We're gonna what a him. reference. What there a you. reference. Like Milo go. Ventimiglia, Gilmore <laughs> reference. <laughs> there you go. I got them all. Um, but two kind of, uh, you know, moments of, of heart from him. You know, Renera is, is feeling it. Lost her mother, uh, a brother she uh, had no chance to know. It's not getting any love for her father, who to this point she feels I'm not a boy, so therefore I've, I've failed him in other other ways. Um, and Damon's the only one that offers any kind of comfort, any kind of comfort. And there's this connection they have. There's also this theme of uh, you know I love the idea of blood. Uh, we talk a lot about traditions, but blood overall. And they're there. They're the ones speaking old Valerian, right? Or high Valerian, low Valerian. You know, we'll bring in David G. Peterson. He can tell which one he's chosen there, but. Um, uh, they're 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 speaking the the the, the homeworld tongue there, man. They got the family, they got the blood, and they're the only ones in this episode doing that. And they got that connection, and he's the only one providing her any kind of comfort until you know. Well, I don't even know if this heiress does giving her even giving her the 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 heir to the throne is not necessarily him providing the comfort that she needs in that moment. But then him speaking to his brother, this is what we're talking about the stuff he's saying, and and he's getting you know here he is absolutely speaking the truth and then his path to the throne is removed which does you know speak to his ambition and getting riled up but i think he's right i and i don't know this isn't saying corliss is bad or otto is bad uh, you know lord strong maybe but you know he's not wrong about that small council you're weak they know it and they're going after you in their own ways viserys yeah. has got to be in the back of said yeah that's right allison is already here and i don't know i'll i'm the only one that's true and it's just one of those moments just when i was completely ready to boo that man now i'm like okay <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm curious to see where he goes. Yeah, I mean, he's he's standing there, and I I, I put out this tweet because it I can't believe it took this long for it to dawn on me. I've been on Casterly Talk already a bunch of times talking about how much I am excited for Damon. It's because my favorite Disney villain is Scar, the younger <laughs> brother, who yes. of course, yes. uh, you know, it comes from yes. Ham Hamlet, of course, and it, it all goes yeah. back. Yeah. Um, but that archetype of like, I'm your brother. And I feel, and this is, you know, not to make yeah. this Lion King talk, but the, uh, the, the energy of, I care from my perspective, I care more than you care. And you yeah. think I don't care. And that's the, yeah. you know, you've all painted me as he cares of nothing. I'm here telling you how much I care. I just care differently. And you demonize me for that. And it's this, yeah. I'm the devil, you know, yes, I'm a rabble rouser, but I'm your brother. And you didn't even consider me to be your yeah. right hand. And 
He's making yeah. that point. He's making the point that you said about Otto saying words we shan't repeat, um, yeah. as he does many times about his own wife, too. Um, yeah. and he's cursing everyone out, and he you know, calls Otto a see you next Tuesday. And we're coming off of the scene where we've already seen how he is ready to jump at his grieving best friend very quickly um, with yeah. his own kid. So there's so much credence given to everything that Damon is saying, like you said, in a very Dooku attack of the clones way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great wrestling meme. There's your wrestling reference of the day uh, of somebody <laughs> yelling in the middle of a promo. Mm -hmm. He's got a great point, Sting, talking about tr Triple H. <laughs> like sometimes these these uh, villains, they yeah. are saying things that are true. And he's right. He doesn't we can make the assumption he doesn't know about the great evil because he's yeah. not an heir. Or maybe he does know because he was heir for a little bit there um, for about yeah. that nine, 10 years. Whether or not he knows doesn't really matter for the theme here. Um, yeah. But because it's it's just facts. Like we are family. And he's almost calling out his brother's hypocrisy too because Viserys mm -hmm. is supposed to be Mr. Keep the Family Together. And he's like, but yeah. you've cast me out in X, Y, Z number of ways. Well, yeah, because you know Damon has the this this is an even deep cut reference to comedy pop culture. He's got the Jay Leno hiding in the closet, listening to the NBC executives talk about whether or not they want him to host the Tonight Show in ninety one, ninety two range. Damon's hiding in the closet, uh, uh, getting all, getting the goods, and you got Viserys being very upset at, at those questioning uh, or just even suggesting Damon's loyalty, and then, then Damon would, would go after him, right? So there, there's Viserys. Uh, family before you all here, but then he makes this decision or he's leading it towards his decision. So of course, Damon's going to be like, what are you talking about, man? Uh, we are blood. We are blood. Uh, old Valeria. And, and, you know, and I love that, uh, the, the scene in which he gives uh Renair the necklace, uh, and, and they both got, uh, you know, Valerian still, um, and that connection to their family, to their traditions, uh, and to themselves and, and, and to, to themselves being house Targaryen. So I don't know, by the way, for our, uh, for our repeat viewers, um, I just want to say, if you remember the prop bets, Dark Sister, First Sword, right, that's First right. Sword, one that's step closer to my chips and salsa prize. Chips and salsa might be on <laughs> on, on, on me. Um, Still plenty it, to go though. Still yeah, go. It, you know, we had we had. Uh, I wouldn't call it an uncomfortable sex scene, uh, you know, unless you're uncomfortable seeing uh, Matt Smith's backside, but uh, we, not in our house. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, we. I forget my count. <laughs> I forget my yeah, sex scene yeah. count, We're but you, yeah, you're on the board. We'll revisit the sheet there um, with everybody's <laughs> scores and predictions, but that did come to, to mind because she says Dark Sister, like, oh, it's Valerian yeah. Steel, like Dark Sister. And he's like, yeah, we both have a piece of our ancestry now. Um, yeah. Because he, you get the feeling like, look at how passionate both of these brothers are about family, just in different ways. Well, um, yeah. Hmm. So, but I'm excited about it because because I love the the, the Damon and, and Rhaenyra kind of looking at uh, House Targaryen, old Valeria. Uh, there's a strength to it. They, they they speak the language. They got the Valerian steel, and I think Viserys has that in his heart as well. But how it hangs over Viserys so differently because he knows this bigger uh, picture, which is just this prophecy from decades ago now, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why, again, going to what he's whittling and carving and, and making out of the stone there, uh, uh, obsessed right. with old Valeria, just in a different way than them. And it makes me think, too, about what's another big literary element of prophecy? Um, mm -hmm. Prophecy or just of, of destiny and fate, even if yeah. it's not written as self-fulfillment. And mm -hmm. it makes me think, you know, we're Star Wars guys, we're always going to connect it to Star Wars. Um, Ray telling Luke, you thought his choice was made for him. It wasn't. And yeah. the fact that the fact that Luke Skywalker felt, could my nephew become a great evil? Should I stop it? Yeah. And help push him toward the great evil. You've got Damon Targaryen being accused of being Magor the Cruel in the making, that he's yeah. just going to be this blight on society, this horrible thing. And he's hearing that. And he's like, you know what? Screw you. <laughs> Love that point. That's a great point. It's the Kylo factor. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that point. Uh, you know, Magor's the cruel. Magor's horrible. And you, you're calling me that. And yeah, again, Damon's done. Already we see this episode. Not done some things I'm improving of here. Yeah. As a fan. No. But but you're right. If you that's you're just so sure. You're so certain that that's uh, that's what I would do. Uh, your small council thinks that, and you kind of maybe agree with them in a way because you don't want me to be the the heir. Like yeah, it's interesting. That's enough. 
set up. Any final big themes and moments? I know uh, we're recording. It's like uh, another time zone for you, and it's real late, uh, but uh, we're having so much fun. Any other big themes jump out to you that we want to discuss? I think that there's an interesting sort of visual. A lot of it is visual because a lot of it is combat, but there's a storytelling mm -hmm. brewing with the themes of hubris and expecting the unexpected and a lot of that classic stuff with the confrontation between Damon and Kristen Cole, where mm. Kristen Cole doesn't get dialogue in this, but he does get the, Oh, he's, he's Dornish. Oh, he's this and that. Oh, he's, uh, he's, he's this unexpected factor. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the reaction though. It's like he's Dornish and there's some, some coded language in there <laughs> about, Oh no. Oh God. He's right. Dornish, but also he's Dornish. Like there's a lot there going on with that. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, the how the the the, yeah. the people that didn't bend the knee, the people that resisted, uh, yeah. the people that we know uh, later on, their representatives, mm -hmm. including Oberon, um, mm -hmm. and how they function and how they mm -hmm. they are survivors and they are a different sort of culture. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not sure how 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 Dornish are you? I, mean, I, don't, yeah. know, I don't know I, what his details are. Um, yeah. But Kristen Cole is able to get the one up on this guy because mm -hmm. he picked his spot really well and because of Damon's hubris. And that's a very classic thing of uh, I'm going to gloat and then get get yeah. defeated. Um, and he's, yeah. he's defeated twice in a joust and in single combat. And so yeah. that creates even more of, a, of an insult. And so that was just a nice planting of the seeds. That whole yeah. sequence, even before the intercutting of the tragedy, uh, yeah. is full of a lot of those moments. I mean, it's already, we are hours out from this debut, uh, just yeah. a few hours and, and Corliss and Rainey's whispering and looking at each other is already a meme. Like look at this married couple uh, <laughs> sizing up everybody. But yeah, I just thought that that was an interesting thing that, that this, this <laughs> great. prince does yeah. get, does get beat two times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like every couple at a party, right? Yeah, that's why you have uh, you go to parties in, in couples, so you can sit there and look mm -hmm. at the rest of the room and go, look at all these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love it. No, very valuable stuff. Love that stuff. And and here, um, we both uh, Miguel Spachnik and Ryan Condal talking about, yeah, this tourney was a great way to show, hey, quite frankly, some of the Game of Thrones action and violence that you, you might be familiar with and eh, maybe on some level might want to crave. We get it, and it um they gave it to us they gave it to us in a great way i love even local details damon kind of uh you know running on uh on, on on the wood there falling to the ground like the sound everything about it was great but then using using it with great purpose as we discussed earlier and this 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 violence uh, and these two different sort of uh, battlefields uh great use of it great use of it yeah mm. absolutely um this isn't a theme thing so much as just like a storytelling choice well maybe somebody could read a theme into it maybe you can um and it, it, it sort of was almost my big negative point for the episode, which was the lack of opening credits. But uh, there is already because I was, you know, we yeah. talked about it. I, we were both excited for our credits. Um, there is already a piece that is running uh, credit to uh, Zoe. Zoe guy from Vulture ran an article right after that. Mm. The title sequence is coming next week. Um, and yeah, yeah, they it, wanted to have a cold open. They wanted to throw us yeah. in that way which I guess does underline a lot of those opening beats. Yeah, no, I, I had thought too, uh, in, in some circles, uh, I've been talking about it with Grace, my fiance, uh, uh, actor herself out here in, in H. Wood. Uh, it's not, uh, some pilots don't have the kind of typical opening sequences, obviously different for Game of Thrones. We are right thrown into that map right away. So I had a little bit of that, oh, uh, is that going to be it? But yeah. Uh, then at the end of the old credits, the, the classic theme song comes in. I was real happy. And yeah, that, that's good to hear because uh, I, I would uh, I would I would definitely miss it going forward. But yeah, I think that's great. Yes. No, very big. Uh, oh, and Condal, uh, Ryan Condal saying in the uh, after the uh, episode uh, featurette. Oh, yeah, I love prologues. <laughs> It's like, uh, yeah, one prologue, you know, I'm glad you're all telling the story here. Let's, let's do it. And now you got Evan Darcy doing it. I love that 100%. I thought of Galadriel as well. I mean, uh, and we'll get to her soon. Um, but the, the whole idea of throwing us in almost in a disorienting type way to, yeah. oh my God, big decision being made already. Like, <laughs> yeah. and I don't even know these people. Um, then of course yeah. we've researched them, but for, for new viewers, for any viewers, 
you're like, oh, who's this king? Oh, he's gone. Oh, no, his reign's at an end. Like, it just sort of throws you into this this <laughs> energy. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's already this regret. There's already this feeling of regret throughout the episode. That's such a yeah. key thing. And I, you know, just to, to you know, you talk about final themes we want to get in. I think about regret and I think about that scene even before the egg on the conqueror reveal when he asks her you get the feeling that this is his like i love my daughter i just need to know right now is she queen material i think she is i need the right answer and and the way that people approach power you know tying all the way back in with your mm -hmm. your big theme of of power and fear it, it sort of made me think of Tywin and Tommen, what makes a great king? Yeah. He's asking her, why do you, what do you think about dragons? What do you think of? And she mm -hmm. gives the answer, well, I see us. And he's like, no, but what about that? He immediately yeah. is on her. He needs her to, on um, pressure, he's being aggressive with her. I need to see yeah. what your gut reaction is. And she says, well, I, it, people think of us yeah. as this higher thing and we're really not. And that's the moment when he knows that she's material. That she's I getting. love it. Great way to take our conversation home too. We can finish up on this big theme. Going back to it, it ties into what we're talking about. Ties to this use of this uh, egg on uh, the conqueror prophecy. It's wonderful. I I'm joking a little bit, but it's almost like she's got uh, media literacy skills. Like she can review a TV show <laughs> and pick up on what's actually there. Uh, I absolutely love that. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Everyone else is like, "Oh, it's a dragon. Make it powerful." And she's like, "No, we're, we, we are we're we're lies. We're we're mm -hmm. tricks." Uh, Varys, the spider is somewhere years in the future. Was proud of her right here, right now. A uh, small man, uh, or, or in this case, a woman can cast a large shadow. Um, and she mm -hmm. understands both sides of that. I love the moment. And I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, he's being tough. He's being cold. He has this uh, sea change where he sees her now. And again, how does, he, in his mind, whether Damon knows or not, that's a great question, lore question, and whether he knows this prophecy and he was in the air for a while, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we'll find out. Or maybe we'll never find out. But I love that the, this burden over Viserys, and he's like, "Who, who is who best protects this? Is it Damon? Is it the Rogue Prince, or is it her?" And I need to see it from her when she gives an answer. Yeah, you're right. I think it's yeah. it's it's it all starts to click, and he finally does something for himself in the in the cell it being the bigger realm the targaryens everything but you know right. he's not listening to the council he's not he's going to maybe even against you know, lord strong and a lot of the others Corlys as well otto um who's got his own designs on the throne from another another angle you know um man i love that i think it's a great it's actually right now i'll say my favorite scene in the show because it ties it all together it might be mine as well Either that or the brother confrontation before the Iron Throne or, or one yeah. on the Iron Throne, one before. Yeah. Um, but it's that, yeah, it's that idea, like you're saying, I'm thinking about the Rogue Prince or I'm thinking about my daughter. And I know mm -hmm. what my brother thinks, even if even if Damon hasn't said, I think I'm a god. Yeah. If, if you take what Rhaenyra is saying, the realm likens us to be above men, to be God, to be godlike, yeah. like our dragons. If, if you're Viserys, you're like, well, I know my brother feels that way. Damon, I'm, yeah, sir. Damon's on yeah. the roof going, I am a golden god. He's almost fantasy yeah. here. He's, I am a golden god, and he's going to jump in a pool. Like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. He's got that that energy. The way that he approaches Caraxes and takes Masaria's hand and is like, You feel that? You feel mm -hmm. that? And like, you, you did the motorcycle thing. That's like, mm -hmm. Hey, babe, check mm -hmm. it out. Like, told you it was rad. Mm -hmm. Like, he's got mm -hmm. that whole energy. Like, this is it. Uh, and he rides off while that's all happening, while the episode's ending. Yeah. The reason why he's being cold and aggressive with her is not just because of grief, it is, but it's also because, oh my God, if this kid, who is a fan of my brother, gives yeah. the wrong answer, then I am effed. Like, yeah. that, like, I can, he feels that because that's the thing is that he loves her. So does Damon. Marry a little too much. And that's the, the whole energy of uh, if she gives the wrong answer, we are doomed because I'm. He doesn't know how much longer he has, but he's not a young man. And mm -hmm. so it's it's that whole idea of if, she, if I need to hear purity and I need to hear fallibility and humanity as, as we see all the way through to Daenerys, who, like mm -hmm. Aegon and like Magor, even though she's in the future, lingers over this episode for us. We've yeah. seen that they are just people and that mm -hmm. Daenerys did struggle and oscillate through those phases of I, I am... I'm the unburnt. I was chosen. I walked out of flame. I brought magic back. 
all of those very deity esque traits that she had, but she was also this woman of kindness and this great mm. friend and the breaker of chains and all of those human things. Yeah. And so there's, there's that it's not just madness and greatness. It is sort of this episode showed me. It is also uh, godhood and humanhood uh, mm. and humanity, humanhood, humanity, uh, humanhood. humanhood's a word now. Um, it's like, and, it's like and 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that she chose well was just so endearing. And I think that, I mean, we haven't yeah. even mentioned Robin Jawadi, the the yeah. piano that kicks in when she's being dressed for her big day. Mm -hmm. I was like, give this man the Emmy right now. <laughs> give it to him. It's already one episode in. I tell you what I thought when I heard that those pianos. Get out of the Sept of Baylor. Everyone get out. Of the <laughs> get out of there. Go. Every time I say that episode, I think it ends differently. No, Marjorie, yeah. you can warn them in time. Oh. Uh, no, it, it's oh. great. Love it. It's Love great. it. Well, um, yeah. we've... Uh, uh, we've had a lot of fun discussing here. We can go on and on and on, but we're going to keep going on all season long. Plus, we'll be discussing Rings of Power. Oh, we got tasty themes coming our way, Alden. Any big final thoughts here as we take it home on uh, this look at episode one of House of the Dragon? Yeah, I don't know if I have big final thoughts. Uh, some small final thoughts, uh, things that go without saying but should still be said. Impeccable visuals, beautiful cinematography, costuming to the next level on a show, on a, on a, on a franchise that was already... Uh, Peak uh, in so many of those yeah. categories. High standard. Yeah. I mean, Damon yeah. alone gets two armor sets here that are phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, Viserys, the, the the garb for the funerals, all of that mm -hmm. stuff was great. I, we mentioned that in our segment uh, with Andres earlier, sort of like the sort of like their winks, but they're more than that with House Baratheon and yeah. how they seem to be the not problem house, but the one that isn't afraid to throw a barb out. The queen, you know, the queen that never was, like yeah. right in front of Viserys, like that's Baratheon behavior. That's a that's a yeah. that's a big uh, tough guy move. Yes, um, it is. So there's a lot of those little nods that I, I appreciated, and I was just I was happy to be back. I was happy to I was happy for small things. I was happy to hear Maesters talk about infections. Yeah, <laughs> I was happy to see infection pus. All yeah. right. We got to that. Yes. Back yeah. Good times. Yeah maybe, think of, yeah. maybe think of Samuel and Jorah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We got references to Dondarians and Tarleys and Stokesworth. We got it Darians. all. Uh, we absolutely did get it all, but it was a wonderfully deep episode. It had a lot to do, not just to live up to the standards of eight seasons. Uh, whether you love all the seasons or not, doesn't matter. The show as a uh, the previous show is a large shadow uh, cast over all the show. And I think this episode did a great job. Uh, bring it out. Even some of the stuff I said up top of uh, this kind of uh, lack of warmth, it's actually just kind of what it's supposed to do. Just we'll see where it goes and we'll see who emerges. Uh, we'll see whose heart shines through. We'll see some of the humor. I'm sure it will be there, but this is a this is a smaller, more intimate, and at times uh, a stoic show as it deals with some big, big questions. So, yeah. there you go, Alden. We've done it. We're off and running here. House of the Dragon has begun uh man uh that 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 in the coming weeks teaser trailer there at the end got me excited uh for what's coming uh this is a, a big start to the show so uh so happy to discuss it with you my friend let them know where they can find you uh if they want to keep following you uh, into the star wars world yeah you can find me personally on twitter and instagram at that alden diaz t-h-a-t a-l-d-e-n-d-i-a-z talking about star wars we've got potathon coming up 15 star wars podcasts 12 ish hours for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Octo Radio, A-H-C-H-T-O Radio is on there. So you can follow that show. Uh, it's where I do all my Star Wars stuff. Ken's been on. Ken will be on again because um, yeah. we got some Star Wars TV coming too. And mm -hmm. uh, that's going to feature the Ryan Johnson interview as part of Potathon. So check that out. It's going to be great. We're already 15% of the way to the goal trying to raise 10 grand. Um, maybe it's hubris, but I feel like we're going to crush that. But we can only crush that if people donate. It's to make a wish incredible cause um so yeah that's what i'm up to right now and then you'll see me as i've already done today throwing things around on the casterly talk twitter get yeah. hype um yeah, so, yeah. I, look here's uh you know um uh i've i've given alden passwords he's signed into things 
we'll see what that does. Now it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm I, so happy to have you here. I have Andres here, and other people are going to be in here as well. I said up top, love bringing different voices onto the show. Some you're familiar with, uh, maybe some new voices. We got a lot to discuss. Also during this season, we're going to figure out when to do it. We're probably going to do one this week, so stay tuned. Follow us on Twitter at Casually Talks. So you can get the updates. We'll probably go do like a live. A recording of a Q&A uh, a few days after each episode so people can kind of come in and join us and ask us questions uh, as we look back and look ahead to the next episode as well. So we've got a lot of things, a lot of things coming your way here on Casually Talk. Uh, I will have more water so I can avoid the, the, the you know, I've been talking too much kind of feeling in my voice. I was just so excited today uh, to get to this. A lot of fun being back. I'm Cat Napsuck. You can follow me at Cat Napsuck. Go to catnapsuck.com to find information. Other things I do like Four Center, Pop Rock and Radio. I'll get my book, Wow. We love Star Wars. All right. All then we've done it. Let's get on out of here. It's Casterly Talk, my friends. We'll see you next time.